Hi everybody, you're very welcome to Capricorn Radio and the Capricorn Radio TV live stream uh, here on the CapricornRadio.com network. Um, we are going to be speaking to author um, Michael E. Sala today and we're going to get into the subject of exopolitics. Uh, this is a new one for me today. Uh, I haven't done much on exopolitics before, a lot of UFO shows, but... Uh, I think I like about Michael is he has pioneered this whole uh, genre uh, of research and exciting discussion. So let me not get complacent. A little biography before I bring on Michael, who's waiting on the call. Uh, Dr. Michael Sala, a pioneer in the development of exopolitics, as I mentioned. He's the author of several books that include exopolitics, political implications of extraterrestrial presence. Dr. Sala was an assistant professor at research in residence in the School of International Service, American University, from 96 to 2004. And he's a PhD in government from the University of Queensland, Australia. He's also the founder of the Exopolitics Institute, a non-profit organization that analyzed the political implications of the extraterrestrial presence. In addition, he is the convener of the June 2006 Hawaii Conference on World Peace and Extraterrestrial Civilization that will focus on space weapons issues. And that's where we're taking a call from today. So hi, Michael, you're very welcome to the show. Hi, and aloha, James. Oh, aloha to you. Wow, what a beautiful part of the world you're in, Michael. I'm on the big island of Hawaii, and it is really wonderful being here, and uh, today's a beautiful uh, Hawaii day. Wow, Michael. Um, great to hear your voice. Great to talk to you today. I've had so many requests to get you on the show, and I get swamped now. Uh, I can only do so many, but I got you here today. Uh, it's exciting for me because... There's something very genuine about what you're doing, Michael. There's something very genuine, uh, not only a non-profit organization, I understand that part, but there is a need for extraterrestrial uh, political discussions, um, this exopolitics. And like I say, I, I don't know if it's fair to say you started the whole thing, but to say you pioneered it to so many groups, uh, uh, exopolitics around the world now. Um, tell me about the inception of the exopolitics uh, infrastructure, um, I guess, first and foremost. Sure. Well, uh, for me, I was very interested in the political implications of extraterrestrial life uh, when I first was introduced to this subject in uh, May of 2001. I was very interested in, in how this impacted international politics because that was the field of study that I was involved in and I was actually teaching at an American university um, in international politics. And so it was very natural for me to kind of look at the information that I, I had been int introduced to through uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project and see, well, how does this impact in a, international conflict? And, uh, and in particular, peace and conflict resolution, which was uh, something that I was very interested in. And the more I studied it, the more it became very integral to understanding what it is that creates international conflict. And uh, unfortunately, that interest was not uh, something that was shared by my academic colleagues who thought that I w I'd really kind of like lost it. And, uh, and that led to me eventually uh, being kind of forced out of the university system that I'd been involved in um, teaching or researching um, for uh, a couple of decades, really. And uh, I have since been involved in promoting exopolitics as a new discipline and started up that 501c3 organization, the Exopolitics Institute, and continue to write and research and organize courses and events concerning ex exopolitics. Oh, wonderful. Of course, you have uh, several books out, um, so much stuff in there. Um, I guess, Michael, for me, there is a need. There's so much stuff. I mean, people can focus on UFO cases from conspiratorial to physical evidence to testimony, but inevitably, you know, there's famous cases like Roswell, and, and that's the, to name a few, and um, the Phoenix Lights, and, you know, people kind of flock to this stuff in terms of almost an obsession in terms of research. I, I can understand that because people want to know, first and foremost, number one, are we being visited? Number two, is the whole thing real? Um, looking at the evidence that you can brush some of it away, but you can't brush it all away. Um, but inevitably, when you get past all that, the reality of it, you're going to have to deal with, okay, why are they here? What are we going to do about it? And um, whether subgroups on the planet or um, what are we going to do with them when we come face to face? Are, are they wanting to meet with us? Are they want us to shake hands? Are they want to uh, talk to us? I mean, is this the nature of exopolitics? Are these the serious questions we have got to grapple with? 
That's exactly right, James, because uh, what distinguishes exopolitics from ufology is that ufology is pretty much interested in the phenomenon of UFOs, accumulating data, evidence that this is a real phenomenon and that there is something worthy of deeper study and analysis in this phenomenon. Um, and that's been going on uh, for uh, six decades now, since uh, 1947. And uh, basically, exopolitics takes a different approach, which is, okay, we have all of this data. Let's start analysing it. Let's start putting together all of the testimonies of whistleblowers, contactees, leaked documents that take us beyond the, the purely kind of scientific analysis of UFO data into this realm of understanding, well, why are they here? Who's in these uh, craft? What are they doing? Why are they uh, contacting people? Uh, what do we understand about the different relations between uh, these uh, visitors uh, with various governments and even amongst themselves. Um, is this something that promotes international peace or is this something that promotes war and conflict? I mean, these are all the sort of questions that exopolitics needs to deal with and more and more people are now becoming drawn to exopolitics because I think for a lot of people now, they, they have answered the question for themselves are UFO reals and is there uh, a substantive extraterrestrial component to this phenomenon? A lot of people have answered that question satisfactorily for themselves in terms of their own research and now they're going into the deeper questions of, you know, who are they, why are they here, what are they doing with us and, and what are we doing in response? And sure. Um, let's, let's talk about individual countries. Obviously, exopolitics is a global um, uh, phenomenon. Um, that's sprung up in several different countries. Each one has their own, um, each one has their, each country has seems to have their own set of subgroups. And yeah, I mean, we can refer to you exopolitics.org, uh, to your website, Michael, if people want to see what this is all about. But, uh, inevitably each country has their own mandate, uh, how they're going to deal with this problem. Uh, cause it is a problem. I mean, first of all, governments haven't acknowledged to their, to their public dominion, um, that this stuff is a real, um, I think, they're trying to slowly go through a disclosure process to, to ease the, the, the blow uh, as such. But inevitably, let's talk, for example, UK, USA, Russia, um, three of the big ones. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of different ways that each country handles um, either disclosure or managing the truth, if you want to call it that way. Or um, So what has exopolitics got to do with each country? Maybe talk about those three countries in particular. What's the exopolitics uh, in, the, in, the, in the individual countries? And then uh, maybe paint it how they three can get on a global scene and discuss things. Sure. Well, when we're looking at those three countries in particular, Britain, uh, the United States, and uh, the Russian Federation, what we have to understand is that they were the victors from the Second World War. And when they went into uh, the defeated Nazi Germany and started to look into what top secret projects the Nazis had been working on, they found that the Nazis had actually developed flying saucers, that the Nazis were the first to develop these craft. And they had done it successfully because they had been able to um, accumulate data uh, beginning in the 1920s on uh, these advanced craft that were found in the literatures of uh, ancient societies and also uh, with communication with certain extraterrestrial civilizations. Um, so this was something that became known um, to these different countries. Uh, Britain in particular in the, in the 19, late 1930s, they, they were aware that the Nazis were developing flying sources, that the, the British Empire was very aware of this British intelligence, and they shared that data with the United States and, uh, and also the Soviet Union was also able to get data that the that the Nazis had developed these flying saucers. And so um, as the war ends, all three went in there and basically pillaged uh, the defeated Nazi uh, German state of all of their resources and scientists that they could find and took, the, and took them back with them into their various countries to start developing these craft themselves. And, of course, with the United States, this was called uh, Operation Paperclip. 
and that's well substantiated. And they were able to develop um, their own secret space programs modelled on what the Nazis had achieved using these flying saucers. So from the very beginning, the thing we need to keep in mind with all of those three countries is that they basically piggybacked on what Nazi Germany had done and in the developing development of flying saucer technologies. And each of those three countries developed their own programs where over the successive decades they have more and more been able to develop and send off into space operational flying saucers and other anti-gravity craft. So what began uh, in the 1930s and 40s as something that was primarily um, focused on extraterrestrial visitation and uh, Nazi testing of these uh, craft over time became a phenomenon where different space programs were launching their own flying sources, their own uh, anti-gravity craft, while at the same time you had extraterrestrials visiting our world. So it, it became very complex. And so today, you know, we can't say for certainty uh, what it is that is being seen in the sky. Is it an extraterrestrial vehicle or does it belong to a secret space program? Wow. There's so much goes on, Michael, isn't there? There's so much happened in our history and then there's so much happened in the public response of how we've had to deal with it. That's what I like about exopolitics. It's getting to the root cause of the matter. It's getting to, to be honest with you, I, I didn't get exopolitics when I seen it first. I, I'm one of these truther guys and I, I don't say truther in a derogatory sense. I like to look for the truth, although it is used in a derogatory <laughs> sense. Um, but I, I get so focused on, you know what? I'm glad exopolitics is there now because it's a necessary component and I never got it at the start. I just wanted to get to facts, the nuts and bolts of the situation. Are they here? I'll deal with the situation myself. But we are in a global hum uh, community. Uh, there are many humanitarian issues on the planet. But if we are being visited, I'm sure um, they're going to worry about the humanity of this planet. We may have even been... Um, you know, engineered in the past. I'm open to that. You know, I do many shows on that. We may have been saved from cataclysms in the past. We don't even know our own history with respect to an ancient alien hypothesis. But, uh, this, this humanity, uh, humanitarian issue that we have on our planet. I mean, are we going to wipe ourselves out, Michael? Do we, do we bring that element into exopolitics? Are we about to wipe ourselves out as a nuclear race? Um, I don't think so. I, I think what's happened uh, was that, uh, as I said from the very beginning, when this phenomenon uh, uh, emerged in the in the thirties and forties, with the with the various governments uh, seeing that this was uh, very real, that we both had extraterrestrial visitation, and that uh, there were these advanced uh, technologies that were pioneered. Uh, by Nazi Germany. And so all of these things basically were secretly studied and not disclosed to the general public. And, and so this is something that became part of the classified world, the black budgets, the black programs, uh, that all of those countries, the major countries, uh, Britain, uh, the United States, uh, Russia, that they all had their own black programs where they were secretly studying these uh, technologies, studying what the Nazis had done, and basically developing um, all of these things in uh, cooperation while at the same time in the kind of open or the kind of uh, the world that we're aware of, you had the Cold War. And, and this was a very clever way in which they could kind of like keep everything secret because uh, everything to do with the Cold War became very highly classified. Psychological warfare, psychological uh, operations were a key part of the Cold War effort. But this was not so much uh, to do really with the, you know, the capitalism versus communism, but it was more to basically hide the fact that uh, these major countries that were involved in the Cold War all had their own secret space programs and they were collaborating. They were working together to get to the top of this issue. And so um, in, in the kind of deepest sense, in the classified uh, world of joint space program corporations, Britain, the United States, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, they were cooperating so that even though uh, all of these countries were leaders in the developing 
development of nuclear weapons and of course people were um, frantic over the possibility of a nuclear a third you know, of a nuclear war uh, really at that deeper level uh, this was not going to happen because these countries were cooperating this was all a cover this was like this was how you could raise black enormous black budget money to fund secret space programs. You had to do it with some kind of conflict that the general public took seriously enough not to deeply question, uh, but that would enable you to raise trillions of dollars in the black budget. And, and just to give you an estimate, uh, James, in, uh, in, uh, in 1988, 1999 in the United States, uh, the estimate of the, of the, uh, of the black budget that was raised to fund these secret programs, this was $1.7 trillion. And at that time, the Department of Defense budget um, in the United States was $300 billion. So we're talking like a secret space program being funded by a black budget, which was five times the size of the uh, the entire Department of Defense budget in the United States, which in itself was larger than the defense budgets of every other major nation on the planet back in that time um, in the late 1990s. So that gives you an idea of, of the vast scope of these uh, black programs and the budgets that fund them. Wow. It's incredible. The money the money that's involved in this whole thing, I mean, people don't realize that the... The financial uh, monopoly on this, um, you know, the control of humanity, the control of governments, political structures, money that's involved, um, you know, it, it's so interlinked in this whole thing. People just think that UFOs or uh, extraterrestrial activity is just something separate to, it's just something separate that goes on and it's either real or not real. And regardless of even if it's real or not real, it's affecting the planet, um, you know, and, and it's, it's interweaving itself into our society. Um, you know, many people in America now are fully convinced that we're being visited by UFOs. The statistics uh, has increased uh, exponentially. Um, I want to talk about your book, Michael, as well, uh, Galactic Diplomacy. Um, you talk about these three conventional political models for representing the Earth. Uh, maybe we can get into this, Michael. Sure. Well, um, when we're looking at uh, the book Galactic Diplomacy, that starts off with the question, well, you know, how do we deal with extraterrestrial visitors? I mean, who's going to represent us in relationships with extraterrestrial visitors? Um, is it is it going to be uh, to the traditional model of uh, states where you actually have major states such as the, the United States, uh, Russia, lesser extent Britain and so forth, um, basically setting up their own dialogue, their own communications with these extraterrestrial visitors? Uh, or is it going to be something that is done through an international organization like the United Nations? Um, this is something that was actually a, a subject of a meeting uh, by the Royal Society, I believe it was in the year uh, 20, uh, 2012, that the Royal Society actually... Um, uh, or actually, it was tw uh, 2010, that's right, yes. Uh, Royal Society organized a conference uh, which was basically dealing with questions about, uh, you know, who would represent humanity with contact. And there was, uh, at the time, the person who headed the outer space um, office for the United Nations came and she, she addressed that question in, in, in London at the Royal Society meeting. And, and so that... That is another model that the United Nations would represent humanity. Or would there be another model, a third model, which is kind of like uh, basically private citizens? Would we, do we have a role to play in all of this? You know, do, do, do we become citizen diplomats and do we interact with extraterrestrials themselves? Um, directly in our own way because uh, they are interested in us. There have been many, many different examples of extraterrestrials having communications and having met with uh, private citizens. So these are all forms of citizen diplomacy or all forms of what I describe as a track two galactic mm. diplomacy. That track one galactic diplomacy involves major states or organizations like the United Nations, but track two involves private citizens. Let's talk about shadow governments as well. I know you get into that in the book. Um, for me, this is the stuff that I actually care about. This is the clandestine, surreptitious, obsequious nature of political organizations that, 
you know, it's it's the murky background to all this. Um, it, it's an element that's there and it's not going away. I have no doubt, Michael, I have no doubt that they are not going to disclose this unless they have to. No government would. It's not in their interest in any way. The only way they're going to disclose the truth, and I know disclosure goes hand in hand with exopolitics, but this government policy is not going to disclose anything because it's they're going to lose control. They are going to lose control. Um, I don't think it's going to be anarchy, Michael. I don't think it's going to be all out anarchy on the planet. I think people would be kind of somewhat sensible about it. And I think the governments would like to market it as an anarchy problem. Um, but I think for the better part, um, if we knew where we're being visited, uh, I mean, tangible evidence where we were shaking hands with these individuals uh, in on the street, like, you know, I think that would certainly change the role of our own position on this planet. Um, our, our cosmos would be, would be known to be bigger, if you if you will, Michael, rather than our just our internal problems and our in house fighting on this little uh, planet Earth. Um, I think that's one of the things that just basically broadened the perspective of everybody. Um, let's let's talk about the this shadow government aspect. How do we get rid of this? How do we educate people, Michael? How do we bring this into the discussion? Oh well, when you raise the question of the, the shadow government or people describe as the cabal, the Illuminati. You know, we need to think that this is not uh, something new. This is this has been around for really millennia. There's a couple of really good books. Uh, there's there's a William Bramley's The Gods of Eden mm -hmm. and also Jim Ma's Rule by Secrecy, uh, which trace uh, this basic lineage, this bloodline uh, that goes back into antiquity um, thousands of years ago. Uh, we're talking about ruling bloodline families that have had access to information, even secret technology, where they are able to prolong their lives for a long time. Um, so we're talking about people, beings, uh, bloodlines that, that have an extraordinary wealth, extraordinary knowledge and uh, that they have uh, a lot of experience in controlling the human masses. And, and they are very good at manipulating humanity into kind of like um, creating um, war, poverty, disease, uh, which ultimately disempowers us. That makes us kind of very easy for them to manipulate. And this has been going on for such a long time. And, and what we're seeing now... Um, over the uh, basically in the industrial age since the 19th century with the industrialization is the advent of technologies that have been uh, used to kind of take us out of that vicious cycle of kind of war poverty disease into a place where you know we are not threatened as much by war Poverty is not something that afflicts us day to day, and disease we have a handle on it. So, if you look at you know our situation today in the in the early 21st century, with the situation in the 19th century, you know, things have improved a lot, and that's because of of technology. And I think that what we are seeing now uh, with uh, these um, secret space programs mm -hmm. that have been developed uh, since the 30s and 40s uh, with the advent of extraterrestrial civilizations coming and visiting us is more and more of these technologies being shared that basically put an end to this vicious cycle of poverty, war and disease. And, and as those things are ended, then we become more empowered uh, you know this is the whole thing of consciousness empowering mm. you know our, our consciousness raising because uh, the more we we get out of, out of those uh, those three things the more we can step into our power and then as we do that as we are able to step into our power not able not only are we better able to use these advanced technologies we are then able to tap into these higher powers in our consciousness uh, where we can kind of do incredible things. So in a way, this whole development of uh, secret space programs, extraterrestrial visitation, um, advanced technologies coming into human society, they, they help us overwhelm or, or to conquer these ancient problems of war, poverty and disease. And in the 
process, we become uh, more able to liberate ourselves of self-limiting belief systems that basically disempower us. And ultimately, what's going to happen is that the power of the Illuminati, the Cabal, uh, is weakened. Their control over us is weakened, which is why they're fighting tooth and nail to prevent these technologies coming out into the public arena, why they're trying to stop us from learning about our extraterrestrial brothers and sisters that are visiting us and basically stopping things like free energy devices coming forward because they know that the day we are able to end war, poverty and disease on our planet, that the power of the cabal over us is ended. Wow. You know, major thing is I've had Nick Pope and I've had Robert Salas. I met Robert Salas in Stuttgart. I had a great chat with him. Um, these guys have some really bizarre, interesting stories to tell us about government institutions being directly affected, uh, nuclear discernment, if you want to call it that, um, by UFOs. Um, if that's the case, um, it puts the exopolitics into a different level. If, if you have to take this body of evidence on, um, I, I'm guessing the governments are going to be scared. Um, I'm guessing it's to affect humanity so that we don't wipe ourselves out with nuclear disarmament. Um, it makes us wake up to our own uh, issues of nuclear um, threats. To it, it, it brings our, it brings our own politics uh, of the world back into a different light again, Michael. Well, that raises really good questions about uh, the issue of UFOs and nuclear weapons, and and that kind of brings us back to this whole topic of national security. Uh, this issue of flying saucers, UFOs, has always been uh, the, the highest national security consideration of, of all the major governments because they realise what happened during the Second World War in terms of the, the power of these technologies and, and how Nazi Germany um, almost succeeded in able to being able to deploy these technologies to win the war. They got very, very close to doing that. And in, and in fact, in terms of uh, Operation High Jump, which was the um, expedition by Admiral Byrd to Antarctica to remove the remnants of the, uh, of the Nazi um, secret bases in Antarctica, uh, that that failed because the Nazis by that time uh, were able to successfully operationalize these craft for, uh, for use in, in military conflict. So this has always been the, the topmost national security issue. And so, um, and this is actually confirmed by, uh, uh, Wilbert Smith, who was a senior radio engineer for the mm. Canadian government in 1950. Uh, he, he wrote a top secret memorandum to the Canadian, uh, Department of Transportation, basically saying that the flying saucer issue is the most classified topic in the United States, more highly classified than, than the uh, nuclear than nuclear weapons. Wow. So that gives you an idea of the national security aspect to this issue. So yes, covering up um, the interest that UFOs have in uh, nuclear weapons, it's just part of the whole national security um secrecy surrounding this entire topic do you think perhaps that's why we see a lot of nuclear decommissioning going on at the moment that they know they're powerless um when people can come in from another part of our galaxy and just disarm them i i think that that was uh, also a big consideration um behind the decommissioning that uh, these technologies um yes as you said um the the data basically shows how the UFOs could basically just appear next to a nuclear silo and disarm all of the weapons, all of the nuclear weapons in there. So it was quite clear that these were not weapons that could ever be successfully used against uh, extraterrestrials because uh, they, they could simply disarm them um, at their origin points. Um, if these were weapons ever to be used, they were going to be used e against uh, humanity. Um, and, but uh, as I said earlier, that the, the secret cooperation between the governments at that highest level uh, was always going to prevent a nuclear war happening between the Soviet Union and the United States and its allies. Mm. Uh, so the decommissioning basically came about because uh, these these were weapons that were kind of not ever going to be used. Uh, they really provided no defense against uh, extraterrestrial uh, visitors. And, uh, and and the other thing to keep in mind is that there are more powerful weapons that exist. Uh, these are weapons that involve uh, 
uh, torsion fields uh, that are kind of temporal weapons that basically disrupt space-time. I mean, nuclear weapons disrupt the, the space-time continuum as well, which is part of the reason why uh, extraterrestrials were very interested in them from the beginning. But there are other weapons that are even more destructive um, that uh, are being secretly studied. So, so yes, the nuclear weapons in a way is kind of like um, old technology uh, mm. that the, the major powers like uh, that Russia and the United States see as, as really not having much of a f- uh, function these days, just very expensive to maintain. Sure. Uh, Michael, tell me about you personally. I know you're a very learned guy. I'm looking at your qualifications. They're awesome. Um, I know you've got a deep interest in government and politics and, and humanitarianism. Um, do you have any personal experiences? Uh, is, 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 why, why the attraction to other politics, exopolitics? Do you see this as the necessary component and you're in a position to, to be in that driving seat to make this stuff happen? Um, is that, is that a fair statement? We're just coming up to break. So, uh, just for the webpage, you can go to capricornradio.com for the free archives and capricornmembers.com for the HD TV and, uh, MP3 archives, uh, but for now, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a moment. There is something majestic in the land of Ireland. This is known the world over. The Celtic Irish are descendants of the Tuatha de Danann, a mysterious, supernatural race of gods written about in ancient Irish Gaelic texts. This is the basis for all Irish mythology and our megalithic ancestors are interlinked with these peoples. You have a chance to come and see these monuments and temples for yourself. The megalithic landscape is rich in the realms of myth, legend and wisdom. Come see all this on the most spectacular Sacred Sites tour in March 2016. The Sacred Sites and Equinox Tour is not to be missed. Tour highlights include Grillen of Aelock Observatory, the Giant's Ring Henge and Dolmen, St. Patrick's Day Special at St. Patrick's Ancient Chair, March 17th, Knockmany Passage Tomb linked to the Queen Maeve with special access, Beemore Temple Complex, Dunluce Castle, the Giant's Causeway, Beltany Stone Circle, Kilcluny Dolmen and the Lock Crew Equinox event alignment. Of course, we will see the famous tombs of Newgrange, Noth, and Doth, also Fornox Rock Art and Shamanic Chamber, Tara Hill Complex, and we're going to finish at the Tua de Danon's origins in the northwest of Ireland at Carroll Keel, dated 3500 BC, and the famous Carroll Moor 5000 BC complex. Check out all the full itinerary on the Tours Events page for more details at jameswagger.com Welcome back to Capricorn Radio. This is your host James and don't forget to check out the archives uh, at capricornmembers.com you can subscribe for membership, uh, doing a lifetime membership deal at the moment. And uh, of course, you can still check out the free archives at capricornradio.com. And then uh, HDTV uh, shows as well on the Capricorn members page. But for now... Um, well, it's it's very interesting. Um, I think it's really just a continuation of, of, of an interest that I've held um, uh, since I began uh, my academic career in 1988-89 uh, uh, when I began doing my PhD in international conflict. I mean, I was looking at what is it that drives international conflict and, and what is it that we can do to help resolve these conflicts at an international level. And so I did field work and studies in places like East Timor, in Kosovo, Sri Lanka. I was very interested in Kashmir as well. And um, all of these places and Northern Ireland as well, some, something that also is a good example of mm-hmm. conflicts. And so I was very interested in conflict and what it is that drives conflict and why these conflicts are so difficult to resolve. And, and through my interest in that, I came across uh, – 
of the information about extraterrestrial technologies and extraterrestrial visitors and black budgets and secret programs and so forth. And I realized that this was just another layer of conflict because I always uh, always thought that that conflict was a dysfunctional aspect of a functional international system. In other words, that, that international conflict was something that, that was bad uh, or that that occurred because um, th- there were people behind it um, who were who were crazies or were do- making poor choices because by and large the international system was functional. You know, we had a United Nations, we had mm. international parties to resolve things. But what I realized when I engaged with this information uh, that Dr. Stephen Greer disclosed and as I went deeper into that, I realized that actually – International conflict is a functional aspect of a dysfunctional system. In other words, that the international system, rather than actually being harmonious and functional with the United Nations at its core to resolve things, actually is dysfunctional, that it's deliberately designed to manufacture international conflict. And so you actually manufacture these conflicts by having crazy people or having crazy ideological systems basically promoted uh, by these deep black projects because they need that to basically perpetuate international conflict so that they could uh, create the the cover so that they could continue to accumulate vast sums of money for secret programs that are run off the books without anyone knowing what's really going on. Wow, you know, you're coming at you today from Northern Ireland and it, it's funny, Michael, you know, uh, I've watched uh, the political process change here dynamically. Uh, we're living in relative peace here. Uh, consider to what it was about 20, 30 years ago. I mean, this place was like Beirut. It was a nightmare in Northern Ireland. Um, now there's relative peace. People just want to get on about their day-to-day business, uh, make their money, you know, feed their families. And uh, I think they're over the past. They know they can't go back and they, and they used politics uh, eventually. They got there. Um, and I see the success of that type of politics, Michael. Uh, I lived with it. I lived through it. Um, um, you know, I just see it as a new type of politics today. I see like this global XL politics. Um, you know, I think it can work. I think there is a necessary component that governments, uh, groups around the world, um, people know the truth. People are going to get to the truth. People, you know, governments know that. The people know that. Um, and the people, you know, I think the more people that get involved, um, the more people that get involved and the more people that get serious about this, I think the more we're going to see this thing develop. Um, would you see that? You see the growth as an important thing? Uh, uh, d- uh, definitely, because I think uh, people are better appreciating now that every international conflict on our planet uh, has behind it elements that, um, manufacturing or driving it or making it difficult to resolve and that the kind of uh, the involvement of black programs in these is now something that people accept you know like the whole idea now of a false flag operation you know like 10 years ago when I first began working in this in this field you know very few people were talking about false flag operations now anything that happens people are saying oh another false flag operation and it's because people are being sensitized that international conflict is being driven by these covert entities that are basically manufacturing the conditions for new conflicts. And so for in the Middle East at the moment, ISIS or ISIL. I mean, here it is. This is exactly an example of how an organization has been created out of nothing, the same as Al-Qaeda before that, Mm -hmm. created out of nothing uh, through covert programs that are are creating these – these entities so that they can create the conditions for international strife and conflict so that the major powers can go into different areas of the world and basically um, pillage or find access to various or information that is there. One of in in 2003, when uh, the United States and its allies went into uh, Iraq, I mean, that was because they wanted to get access to secret technologies that uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein was able to basically get access to, and he was ready to reveal this to the world. Uh, so they went in there. They manufactured that whole conflict. And so I think a lot of people now are understanding that there are deeper levels of uh, – to analysing these international conflicts, and and at the deepest level is the exopolitical. Sure, uh, I got an interesting question in the chat room from Edward Delaray. Um, 
I guess it's a double question. Do we have a list of these cabal groups or is it as simple as royalty is rule, ru, ru, ruling the world? Does it head back down to the royal royal families of the world? I, I think it basically comes down to these ancient bloodlines and uh, they are very secretive organisations. Uh, they're not necessarily like the royal families, like the, the Windsors and so forth that... Uh, that people kind of identify as as, as being being very powerful, you know. In a way, these uh, these royal families are kind of like uh, puppets or useful tools uh, for these bloodline families to basically keep power. Um, so so they they are doing it all behind the scenes, and that uh, the, the the cabal, the Illuminati, do operate in secrecy. They they don't. You know, people that are often associated with the cabal, people like uh, David Rockefeller or Henry Kissinger, you know, these are kind of like uh, really intermediaries. They're, they're useful tools for organizing um, kind of uh, leading business people or, or political leaders or families or, or celebrities and so forth to attend events, you know, whether it's Bilderberg or whether it's uh, um, in, in San Francisco, various places where you have these elite gatherings, um, Bohemian Grove, for example. Oh, yeah. uh, but really these bloodline families, they're the ones that have control and, and they're very secretive and, and very few of them are known publicly. Wow. Uh, let's mention Eisenhower. I know you get into this in the book as well. Uh, Eisenhower, Eisenhower's secret meetings with the uh, extraterrestrials. This is incredibly revealing, um, Michael. Yes, well, uh, very interesting uh, that uh, Eisenhower had meetings with extraterrestrials in 1954 and 55 um, at their many whistleblowers that have come forward to talk about what happened at these meetings. And basically it said that um, the meetings began with the extraterrestrials being uh, very concerned about uh, the U.S. developing thermonuclear weapons, uh, hydrogen bombs, which were the most destructive form of nuclear weapon, even today, uh, a thousand times more powerful than the bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima that, that were fissile uh, or, or fission nuclear weapons. These uh, fusion nuclear weapons or thermonuclear weapons were just so much more powerful and the extraterrestrials wanted the US to stop developing that because uh, you know these were destructive not only potentially for humanity but also for the extraterrestrial visitors themselves. Mm. Um, Eisenhower was advised by his advisors not to agree to the requests of the extraterrestrials at that first meeting in 1950 at Edwards Air Force Base sure. um, and then he had another meeting in, in 1955 at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico where they reached an agreement basically to exchange technologies um, and, and to give the extraterrestrials uh, certain rights in terms of establishing bases on the earth and eventually being able to conduct genetic experiments with people and so that's how you have the whole kind of abduction phenomenon taking off from that early period with Eisenhower. But, but Eisenhower... Um, he, he felt that he was betrayed by the people who had advised him to reach these agreements with the extraterrestrial visitors. And by the end of his administration, he was very angry with the Majestic 12 group that were basically the ones that had uh, um, pressured uh, or, or advised Eisenhower to, to reach these agreements with the, the kind of more negative or, or kind of regressive extraterrestrial groups. And so Eisenhower, at the very end, he was very upset with that. And uh, he advised Kennedy. He told Kennedy what had happened because Kennedy also knew a little bit about the uh, extraterrestrial visitors and the uh, involvement of Nazi Germany and all of this. And so um, Eisenhower told Kennedy all about this. And so Kennedy, when he began his uh, term of office, he was uh, very intent on getting control. Sure. Uh, i got another really great question here. Uh, I guess it's a racial question and a political question all in one. Uh, what can we say about the diversity of the extraterrestrials that are visiting this planet, just like we have different racial groups on our own planet and different political nations or countries on our own planet from first, second and third world, ones that you know are only caring about their agriculture and trying to feed uh, their nations and some are you know, more aggressive and warmongery and the other ones are in the middle, the second world countries that are trying to develop. Um, you know, what can we say uh, politically and racially about the extraterrestrials visiting our planet? What do we know, in, I guess, in a nutshell? 
Oh, that's a really good question, James. Uh, what I know, what I've discovered is uh, basically that there are 22 different extraterrestrial civilizations wow. that have seeded humanity with their genetics. Um, and so that means that these 22 different races um, have been monitoring humanity for uh, for hundreds of thousands of years or however long they've been conducting their, their genetic experiments. And, um, and this accounts for the different uh, racial subgroups on the planet. And so you will have one group of extraterrestrials um, kind of like being more interested in, say, the development of, say, the like the, the northern European kind of uh, racial um, groups uh, because they, they are related. So, so that would be, say, say the, the Lyran or the, or the Pleiadians would be more interested in, say, the Scandinavian or the northern uh, Germanics. Uh, you, you would have um, another group, say, uh, beings from uh, Sirius B or, or the Sirius, uh, Syrian star system being more interested in, say, the uh, development of uh, humans in, say, the uh, Indian subcontinent. Then you have uh, those that are, say, more interested interested in, um, in Asian groups and then you have those that are interested in, say, African genetics and so forth. So I think when you look at all of the different racial groups on, on planet Earth, you can connect most of those, or virtually all of them, uh, to different extraterrestrial visitors. Um, uh, the only exception that I have been told is that uh, in Africa uh, that there is... Uh, Genetics that is indigenous to the earth. So if we were talking about, you know, who are the indigenous peoples of the planet, we would look at maybe the Africans or certain, uh, African subgroups as, as being truly indigenous to the earth. But virtually everyone else has to more or less a, a greater degree, uh, different extraterrestrial genetics as part of their, um, DNA. And, and there are two people that have talked about this, um, Alex Collier. Um, has talked about this at length in terms of uh, his what he was told by um, a group of extraterrestrials called the Andromedans. And then there's an, another whistleblower, more recent, uh, Corey Good, who has worked with uh, secret space programs, and he has uh, been uh, attending meetings. Uh, w he calls them super federation mm -hmm. uh, meetings involving human-looking extraterrestrials. And he says that at these meetings, uh, they are basically in charge of these. They're, they're conducting 22 different genetic experiments that go back hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, 250,000 years in, uh, in particular. That's the timeline he gives. And at these meetings that there are between 40 to as many as 100 different human-looking extraterrestrials that are attending these meetings. So when we look at the human genome, uh, humanity, um, there are many different varieties. Uh, as he, and he said that mm. some of the beings on this, attending these meetings uh, don't look like humans on Earth. You know, like they like they have bright orange skin and blue eyes and so forth. So, you know, these these don't these aren't similar to any particular racial group on the planet. So there are many more racial groups that are kind of human looking uh, that that are attending these uh, super federation uh, meetings, according to Corey Good, but that on Earth itself there are 22 different ET genetic experiments that are being conducted and are being observed. Sure. Uh, in your own opinion, I guess, Michael, do you think there's any particular extraterrestrial group that are going to physically harm us? Or do you think there's any of these guys bad? And I mean inherently bad. I don't mean somewhere, you know, in the middle benevolent or something. I mean seriously, you know, out to manipulate or control. Um, I don't think so, you know, because when you look at the, the, all of the data, I mean, this, this is uh, the the series Ancient uh, Aliens. I mean, that yeah. kind of shows you the data that goes back thousands, thousands and thousands, thousands of years yeah. ago. Uh, that extraterrestrials have been visiting us, that they were worshipped as gods by our, by our ancestors, and they gave us advanced technologies. And at certain times in history, uh, we had our own really technologically sophisticated societies that had their own space program. That uh, that the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Indians, the uh, ancient Mayans, that all of these groups had their own advanced technological societies, and that they were 
as successful in establishing um, space programs that uh, were able to go off into space and uh, develop their own colonies. This is something that Corey Good talks about at length in his uh, in his disclosures. So you know, when you look at all of that literature, um, you know. The, the question of are extraterrestrials going to kind of invade us and take us over, in, in a way it, that's kind of like, it's not really representative of the true history of humanity. They've been here for so long. They have so many different extraterrestrial experiments going on here. As I said, there are 22 different extraterrestrial uh, races that have long-term interests in humanity. So if you have a a new group of extraterrestrials coming along here. It's like, you know, it's not as though they can sort of come in, oh, look look at these primitive humans. We can take them over. You know, it's like they get they get pushed back to the queue and say, hey, you know, we've been here for 300,000 years. We've been doing our stuff. You get back to the end of the queue mm-hmm. here. You know, you, sure. you wait your turn. That's really, I think, what's going on. Sure. Um, a question again from Edward Della Ray. He says, do we know of any physical artifacts that are publicly known as being extraterrestrial? Do you look at this uh, tangible evidence, Michael? I mean, there's some bizarre out-of-place artifacts on this planet. And uh, Do you draw any evidence towards that? Well, you know, there's a, there's a few things that we could draw attention to. Uh, one is like the pyramids, mm. the, the pyramid of, uh, of, of Giza, the Great Pyramids. Oh, yeah. You know, you look at the construction of those and it's like, well, uh, you know, clearly this was developed by a society with advanced technologies. Now, um, you know, was it purely a function of an Egyptian society that had technology that was far in excess of what uh, we know of today? I mean, some of those blocks um, that would build the pyramids, and you, you had the same thing in, in Baalbek in, in Lebanon. Some of these blocks are like, uh, you know, like I think the biggest ones in Baalbek are like a uh, thousand tons or one thousand two, one thousand two hundred tons. Even now, even the most uh, advanced uh, construction equipment uh, would have extreme difficulty if it could actually, you know, lift one of these uh, big building blocks. But here they are in ancient Egypt or in. Uh, Places like Belbek in uh, in Lebanon, oh, yeah. you know, they were building uh, facilities using these huge blocks. So clearly, they had advanced technologies. Um, you know, so I think we can look at those sites, Belbek in in Lebanon, or the, the Great Pyramid in in Egypt, and basically say, well, there's every reason to think that these are, if not advanced. Um, kind of extraterrestrial technologies, then at the very least the technologies of an advanced civilization that at one point um, inhabited that part of the world. And and then, of course, you know, we could look at other things uh, more, more recently, like the uh, like the the glyphs in um, in in Peru, the um, Nazca lines, those big glyphs there. In terms of well, you know, again, is is this something that was built by kind of primitive humans for kind of decoration, or was this built because it serves some function for some kind of extraterrestrial or advanced technological society? Um, the Ancient Aliens se- uh, series, I think, does a really good job in bringing out all of these anomalies that. Um, uh, are probably artifacts going back thousands of years to various different extraterrestrial races. Mm. Wow. Uh, what about the Fukushima disaster? Does uh, that affect the exopolitical uh, discussion? Do we uh, are extraterrestrials interested in that? Do we st- people think there's a conspiracy that the Americans made that happen with harp technology? I, I, you know, if they had harp technology, why wouldn't they create a disaster to c- topple another country? I've no, I've no issues with that, you know, saying whether that's true or false. Um, but I, I, is that an exopolitical argument? Do you, do we see that again? It's nuclear. It's a disaster. Uh, it's going to affect the whole planet. Oh, definitely. Yes, it's very much an exopolitical question because you've got to go beneath the surface level of looking at well, what 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 really happened here. And I think there's been some really good research done on showing that this was a manufactured um, uh, tsunami. Um, that uh, this was really a false flag operation, and and so once again we're in this that issue of false flag operations and a and a secret government or a kind of uh, or, or some assets of the cabal, Illuminati ruling bloodline families, basically orchestrated the the Hirosh- uh, the, the Fukushima crisis mm-hmm. or the, the the tsunami that basically destroyed the nuclear facilities there. 
they wanted to put pressure on the Japanese government that was showing signs that it was not going to cooperate any longer in terms of the kind of agenda of the cabal Illuminati that the Japanese government, for one thing, the Japanese government provides enormous amounts of money for the funding of black programs that is run by the cabal Illuminati in, in their own secret space programs. So they, they basically been milking the Japanese for decades. And every Japanese uh, prime minister um, wants to try and kind of cut back on this and try and assert greater Japanese independence from the from these uh, cabal from the shadow government. And um, and and they are kind of like. Uh, shown in no uncertain terms you know where the real power is and what can happen and so fukushima was really a demonstration to the japanese leadership saying look this is what we can do to you you're, you're really only a small mm -hmm. island and if you're not careful we'll do this and we'll, we'll make japan uninhabitable if you cooperate with you with us then we'll we'll make sure nothing happens to japan and by the way you know we'll we'll, we'll get we'll we'll organize it so that you get to have the olympic games in 2020 <laughs> Wow. Um, Michael, we're coming up to the top of the hour and the end of the show. We've got five minutes to go. I guess, first of all, just give people out some, some of the names of your books. You've got many there uh, and where we can get a copy of them. Sure. Well, you can go to exopolitics.org. That's my main website, EXO politics.org and there you'll find information on all, all the books uh, the, the two books that I would really kind of like recommend that are kind of uh, more recent um, uh, both were all, both came out in, in 2013 one is Galactic Diplomacy sure. you've already mentioned that yeah. the other is uh, Kennedy's Last Stand and, and that's, uh, I think, a very important book because it basically goes into how the secret government organized for President Kennedy to be uh, assassinated sure. because he was trying to get access to classified UFO files. So that's something you'll find more information at, at the website. Or just go to Amazon.com and just kind of uh, type in my name and you'll see uh, all my books come up and you'll see Kennedy's last stand there. So... Yeah, I think uh, that's all they need to do. Just go and I and exopolitics.org. I also have uh, the latest information on this new uh, whistleblower who's recently come forward, uh, um, Corey Good, who has some incredible information about the secret space program. So I've got a lot of articles and a resource page on exopolitics. Dot org where you could find out more about uh, Corey Good's uh, testimony. Sure. I think I heard a show with him and David Wilcock on recently. I'm trying to get a hold of the guys to get on the show. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to check into that. Actually, Michael, I stay clear of your book, Kennedy's Last Stand, Eisenhower UFOs, MJ-12 and JFK's Assassination, because I want you to come back on the show and uh, maybe discuss that book in the not-too-distant future. Um, but, yeah, looks fascinating. And, you know what? I see you getting into these issues, uh, Michael, um, which are going to be labeled conspiratorial. They're going to be labeled uh, alternative, whatever. But I see you doing this from a very sane, a very logical, a very thorough uh, research perspective. Um, and I think it's for the betterment of humanity to discuss this stuff. Um, but I guess to maybe wrap things up, did you ever see the success of the exopolitics movement when you started all this, Michael? Um, I, I knew that eventually exopolitics uh, would, would be accepted because it's a discipline. It's, it's like exobiology or exoplanetology. It's a discipline of learning. It goes beyond any particular individual or a movement that's associated with it. It's a discipline that its time will come because eventually um, people will embrace the idea that extraterrestrials are real and so there's going to be a political element to it. So you, you're going to call that something like exopolitics and that's probably the most logical term and that's the one I kind of uh, embraced back in uh, uh, 2002, 2003 and have been promoting ever since. But yes, I, I think exopolitics, it's, uh, it's a movement, it's a discipline, its time has come and it will continue to grow and eventually every university um, in Northern Ireland and around the world mm -hmm. will, will have uh, professors teaching exopolitics. For sure. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure talking today. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, you're listening to CapricornRadio.com and, of course, today's author, Michael E. Sala. Uh, you can catch his books on Amazon and his website, exopolitics.org. Michael, uh, aloha again from Hawaii. It's been a pleasure to hook up with you today. And, uh, you know, we'll talk to you in the not-too-distant future for his follow-up show, I hope. Mahalo, James. Aloha.
Hi everybody, you're very welcome to Capricorn Radio and the Capricorn Radio TV live stream uh, here on the CapricornRadio.com network. Um, we are going to be speaking to author um, Michael E. Sala today and we're going to get into the subject of exopolitics. Uh, this is a new one for me today. Uh, I haven't done much on exopolitics before, a lot of UFO shows, but... Uh, I think I like about Michael is he has pioneered this whole uh, genre uh, of research and exciting discussion. So let me not get complacent. A little biography before I bring on Michael, who's waiting on the call. Uh, Dr. Michael Sala, a pioneer in the development of exopolitics, as I mentioned. He's the author of several books that include exopolitics, political implications of extraterrestrial presence. Dr. Sala was an assistant professor at research in residence in the School of International Service, American University from 96 to 2004. And he's a PhD in government from the University of Queensland, Australia. He's also the founder of the Exopolitics Institute, a non-profit organization that analyzed the political implications of the extraterrestrial presence. In addition, he is the convener of the June 2006 Hawaii Conference on World Peace and Extraterrestrial Civilization that will focus on space weapons issues. And that's where we're taking a call from today. So hi, Michael, you're very welcome to the show. Hi, and aloha, James. Oh, aloha to you. Wow, what a beautiful part of the world you're in, Michael. I'm on the big island of Hawaii, and it is really wonderful being here, and uh, today's a beautiful uh, Hawaii day. Wow, Michael. Um, is that ufology is pretty much interested in the phenomenon of UFOs, accumulating data, evidence that this is a real phenomenon and that there is something worthy of deeper study and analysis in this phenomenon. Um, and that's been going on uh, for uh, six decades now, since uh, 1947. And um, basically, exopolitics takes a different approach, which is, okay, we have all of this data. Let's start analysing it. Let's start putting together all of the testimonies of whistleblowers, contactees, leaked documents that take us beyond the, the purely kind of scientific analysis of UFO data into this realm of understanding, well, why are they here? Who's in these uh, craft? What are they doing? Why are they... A contacting people, uh, what do we understand about the different relations between uh, these uh, visitors uh, with various governments and even amongst themselves? Um, is this something that promotes international peace or is this something that promotes war and conflict? I mean, these are all the sort of questions that exopolitics needs to deal with and more and more people are now becoming drawn to exopolitics because I think for a lot of people now, they, they have answered the question for themselves, are UFO reals and is there uh, a substantive extraterrestrial component to this phenomenon? A lot of people have answered that question satisfactorily for themselves in terms of their own research and now they're going into the deeper questions of you know who are they why are they here what are they doing with us and, and what are we doing in response and sure um that's great to hear your voice great to talk to you today i've had so many requests to get you on the show and i get swamped now uh, i can only do so many but i got you here today uh, it's exciting for me because there's something very genuine about what you're doing, Michael. There's something very genuine, uh, not only a non-profit organization, I understand that part, but there is a need for extraterrestrial uh, political discussions, um, this exopolitics. And like I say, I, I don't know if it's fair to say you started the whole thing, but to say you pioneered it to so many groups, uh, uh, exopolitics around the world now. Um, tell me about the inception of the exopolitics uh, infrastructure, um, I guess, first and foremost. Sure. Well, uh, for me, I was very interested in the political implications of extraterrestrial life uh, when I first was introduced to this subject in uh, May of 2001. I was very interested in, in how this impacted international politics because that was the field of study that I was involved in and I was actually teaching at American University um, in international politics. And so it was very natural for me to kind of look at the information that I, I had been int introduced to through uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project and see, well, how does this impact in a international conflict? And, uh, and in particular, peace and conflict resolution, which was uh, something that I was very interested in. And the more I studied it, the more it became 
very integral to understanding what it is that creates international conflict. And uh, unfortunately, that interest was not uh, something that was shared by my academic colleagues who thought that I w- I'd really kind of like lost it. And, uh, and that led to me eventually uh, being kind of forced out of the university system that I'd been involved in um, teaching or researching um, for uh, a couple of decades, really. And uh, I have since been involved in promoting exopolitics as a new discipline and started up that 501c3 organization, the Exopolitics Institute, and continue to write and research and organize courses and events concerning ex- exopolitics. Oh, wonderful. Of course, you have uh, several books out, um, so much stuff in there. Um, I guess, Michael, for me, there is a need. There's so much stuff. I mean, people can focus on UFO cases from conspiratorial to physical evidence to testimony, but inevitably, you know, there's famous cases like Roswell, and that's the, to name a few, and um, the Phoenix Lights, and, you know, people kind of flock to this stuff in terms of almost an obsession in terms of research. I, I can understand that because people want to know, first and foremost, number one, are we being visited? Number two, is the whole thing real? Um, looking at the evidence that you can brush some of it away, but you can't brush it all away. Um but inevitably, when you get past all that, the reality of it, you're going to have to deal with, okay, why are they here? What are we going to do about it? And whether subgroups on the planet or um, what are we going to do with them when we come face to face? Are they wanting to meet with us? Are they want us to shake hands? Are they want to uh, talk to us? I mean, is this the nature of exopolitics? Are these the serious questions we have got to grapple with? That's exactly right, James, because uh, what distinguishes exopolitics from ufology. Let's talk about individual countries. Obviously, exopolitics is a global um, uh, phenomena um, that's sprung up in several different countries. Each one has their own. Um, each one has their. Each country has seems to have their own set of subgroups. And yeah, I mean, we can refer to you exopolitics.org uh, to your website, Michael, if people want to see what this is all about. But uh, inevitably, each country has their own mandate. Uh, how they're going to deal with this problem? Because uh, it is a problem. I mean, first of all, governments haven't acknowledged to their to their public dominion um, that this stuff is real. Um, I think they're trying to slowly go through a disclosure process to to ease the the, the blow uh, as such. But inevitably, let's talk, for example, UK, USA, Russia, um, three of the big ones. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of different ways that each country handles um, either disclosure or managing. The truth, if you want to call it that way, or um, so. What has exopolitics got to do with each country? Maybe we talk about those three countries in particular. What's the exopolitics uh, in the in the in the individual countries, and then uh, maybe paint it how they three can get on a global scene and discuss things. Sure. Well, when we're looking at those three countries in particular, Britain, uh, the United States and uh, the Russian Federation, what we have to understand is that they were the victors from the Second World War. And when they went into uh, the defeated Nazi Germany and started to look into what top secret projects the Nazis had been working on, they found that the Nazis had actually developed flying saucers, that the Nazis were the first to develop these.